<laughs> it is Tuesday. And the, the, uh, the item that I wanted you to have is here now. And there were further glitches that you don't know about, but it actually arrived today. And so as you're heading out the door, we'll make sure that they are available. What it is is just simply as a carabiner. And uh, it's got a neat key clip on the, on the end. And then on the carabiner itself, it says, choose Joshua 24, 14 through 15. And I'd like to have everyone to be able to, to have one. All right, so it's Tuesday. And with that, it is Tuesday, which means there is a worship service that Pastor Ken Kroniger has, has assembled together with a great assembly of people to assist him. Let's worship God.
Please join in unison in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it.
Please join in unison. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead and lives eternally with the Father, and that he will come again with power and great glory. We believe that eternal life begins in knowing God through a commitment to Jesus Christ. We believe that because he died and lives again, resurrection with spiritual and imperishable bodies is the gift of God to the believers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this moment in time, we as your people have come to worship to give you all honor and glory and praise with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We do this because of the rich gift that you have given us in your Son, Jesus the Christ, the one Father in whom we have salvation and we declare to be Lord, He who was our teacher, even teaching us the way of prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be a king of a vast domain or be Jesus, that men's applause, I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be holy name than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin stretch sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He's fairer than lilies of rain. Ha 
money out of the cold. He's all of my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Our theme tonight is love. And we want to talk about love in its various forms for just a moment, as we know it in English. So if you're here today and you're a husband with a wife, or you're a, boy a boyfriend with a girlfriend, and you love pie, I want you to stand up right now. If you're here today, boyfriend, girlfriend, with a boyfriend or girlfriend, and you love pie, I would like for you to stand up right now. If you love pie and you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, now. Okay, now that you've stood up, I want you to turn to your boyfriend or girlfriend and tell them, I love you. Okay, I hope they feel better now. Let's have a seat. I'd like to invite my brother to come up for just a moment. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if, uh, if you don't know him, this is the Reverend Donald Croniger, and uh, he is my brother. And I want to say that we have something called brotherly love. Sometimes it really doesn't show, but other times it isn't. But I do want to say that I admire my brother. You see, we tease him a lot about saying whatever. But his word whatever is a thing of faith. For me, I have to work up faith. For him, he has a gift of faith. Brotherly love. But brotherly love goes beyond that sometimes for us because all of us have experienced what we call fictive kinship relationships. And what that means is you got an aunt or an uncle in the church that isn't really biologically connected to you. Well, I want to introduce you to our other brother, <laughs> Reverend Harold King. Now, Harold, you have a story that you can tell. Would you do so but at the mic? A number of years ago at conference, I was chosen to preach one of the, the messages in the evening, and, and Don was leading the music throughout the week. And one afternoon, after he had been leading the music, a lady came up to me and said, Oh, you're such a great singer. You do such a wonderful job leading the music. And I said, No, that was my brother. And they says, Oh, well, Ken, you did such a wonderful job preaching the other night. I said, whatever. <laughs> and, and we know it's true that Harold is our brother because it came out in the Sabbath recorder with a picture. And that proves it whenever it's in the Sabbath recorder. But then I want to introduce you to two other people. The Reverend Gordon Lawton and the Reverend Dr. Larry Lawrence Watt. Would you guys come on up for just a moment? A long time ago, these guys met at seminary. How did that happen? I had gone to Central Baptist Seminary and Larry met me in the hallway. <laughs> and, what and, he, and he tried to say, Sabbath, that's not right. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> actually, maybe his memory is different. Actually, well, actually, part of it's the same, but actually, I went to church Sunday morning, as any good Christian would do. 
And I came home dressed in my suit, and here comes the only other seminarian on campus that day, down in a pair of blue jean shorts and a shirt, and he looks at me and he says, do you want to go to church picnic with me? He said, hmm, sure, there's nothing else to do around here. And um, we went to, I think it was Charles Wheeler's farm. Mm -hmm. Charles Wheeler's farm. We went out to Charles Wheeler's farm. I met all of these wonderful Christian people. Nobody bothered to tell me they went to church on the wrong day of the week. Until <laughs> <laughs> the next day, and then I decided I was going to make it my mission to prove Gordon wrong. And here we are. <laughs> There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and here are two that I would say we've experienced love with. Now, there's something significant about the group in front of you. Larry, where'd you graduate from? Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, North Kansas City, Missouri. And Harold, where'd you graduate from? Baptist Theological Seminary, Kansas City, Missouri. And Don, where'd you graduate from? Central Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas. <laughs> Kansas City, Kansas, right? Okay, where'd you graduate from, Gordon? Central Baptist, Kansas City, Kansas. And I graduated from the Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. So all of us are from there, but we got one more. Charlotte, where'd you graduate from? Central Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Kansas. <laughs> and, and, and so all of us are gathered here from Kansas City. Just so you know, I went to Central. <laughs> <laughs> God is good. Thank you, gentlemen. God is good to us. And there's one more form of love that we want to talk about tonight. He said, the, the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said this. He said that there is a living relationship that experienced the relationship between the Lord Christ and the assembly. And that is the relationship between husband and wife. And so at this time, I would like to invite my wife Peggy to come up. Now, Peggy and I, if I get it right, we're married in, on May the 23rd, 1993. Yes, oh, good. That means we've been married 21 years. And one of the things we want to talk about is how love is demonstrated. Over, not only was she the editor for my thesis, but over the last few years, she's been my eyes. And so thank you for being my wife. Stay up here. Stay up here, Peg. Peg, just stand right over here. Linda? <laughs> Linda and I were married December 29, 1978. We chose Friday so everybody could rest on Sabbath. <laughs> This December, it will be three dozen years, 36. How do I know Linda loves me? I asked her to marry me, and she took some time to think about it. And she said, it wasn't because I didn't love you, but I wasn't sure I wanted to marry a pastor. And she married a pastor. My wife was not able to be here. My wife is Rockley Watt, Rockley Goodson Watt. She was not able to be here because she is at home teaching autistic students over the summer break. But she allowed me to come. Um, we were married on July 5th, 1986. About, what was it, three weeks ago, we have been married for 28 years. I know that my wife, there, there are three things I need to say. I, need, I know that my wife loves me. First of all, she gave up her cat for me. <laughs> Secondly, I didn't know it at the time, but I had said that I wanted to get married in Salem, West Virginia, because I thought that was where she wanted to get married. 
she told me afterwards she really wanted to get married in Falk, Arkansas, because Falk, Arkansas is where she had spent her time. That is where her father passed away. And so I thought that was significant. The third thing is, my wife puts up with me. You know, <laughs> I, said, I, said that that was, I said that I was going to say that's a very hard thing to do, but my daughter told me she would say amen. <laughs> I don't hear it. <laughs> but no, it's a. I know that I'm not that easy to put up with, but she never, ever stops. She writes me notes. She always has a smile in the morning, which is more than I can say for me. And in case she's watching on video, which she said she was going to do. We were married on August 3rd, 1968. Sunday, it will be 46 years. Amen. Kathy has shown her love in so many ways. One of the things that really impressed me was a number of years ago when I was in seminary in Kansas City. She got a job working at KU Medical Center, and it was the best job, the highest paying job she had ever had. And when it came time for graduation, I kind of went with fear and trembling because she came home from work every day so happy, and she just loved that job. And I told her that we had accepted a call to go to Nortonville, and we would have to move. And she did it willingly, never complained, she gave up something that she loved because she loved me more. Kathy, thank you. Well, it's my turn, Charlotte. <laughs> as, as time goes on, uh, end of uh, this next month would be 33 years. Yes. <laughs> and her mom would say, well, see, see um, her mom would remind mind me and everyone as I look at her mom. Her mom was a card giver. Every time we turn around, we get a card from her mom. Charlotte's like that. Charlotte is one who would always give cards. When we were at seminary, um, well, as you heard, Charlotte was at seminary. I was in Shiloh. My first phone call to the seminary after Shiloh encouraged me to go to seminary, guess who I spoke to on the phone? Can I finish the rest of the story? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, all I remember getting this phone call from this Don Kroniger, and he lived at Fogg's Trailer Park, and I thought that was the dumbest address I ever heard of. <laughs> but he came, and the other part of it is I called him Donald for a long time. That was a distancing thing. I thought he was a great singer, but that was about it. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then I was minister of music at an American Baptist church, and I had invited him to come and sing for a missions event. And we prayed before he sang, and it was like the heat of heaven came on my heart. And I knew without a doubt that he was the man that God wanted me to marry. And then we were married for how many years? 33. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be 33. We'll be 33. As I saw Charlotte, Charlotte was involved in, in, in assistant in admissions there at Central. 
as well as graduating from there. And of course, she was the first one I spoke to. But I tried to, tried to uh, indirectly woo her affections by placing flowers on her desk. They were roses, red roses. But she was supposed to know it was me. And so a friend of mine and, and uh, myself talked to a friend of hers to get her out of the office one day. Her name was Ganya. And Ganya got her to go down, Charlotte to go down to the copy machine, okay, get out of the office. And I placed this rose on her desk. Well, she was supposed to know it was me, but years later I found out that Ganya told her everything. <laughs> <laughs> that it was me. And she was keeping that a secret for a, a long time until that prayer together. <laughs> Love you. Love you too, honey. Thank you. And you're fine. <laughs> and so the song asked the question, what's love got to do with it? And we would answer much in every way.
breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep.
satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, I will go, Lord. I will lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. I will hold your people, I will hold your people in my heart. I will hold your people in my heart. It seems like a long time ago now. I was a summer pastor for two summers in a place called Farina, Illinois. There were people there like Thelma Disk and Catherine Crandall. There was a fam man and a woman there by the name of Lee and Thelma Stewart. And at that time, as a young pastor, I had a habit. And Lee would say to me afterwards, you were going to work, weren't you? Well, here's the habit. And we're going to go to work. We're going to look together at this Gospel of John, this passage that appears here between Jesus and Peter. And if you'll notice for a moment, as you look at the Scripture in John 15, in John the 21st chapter, the 15th verse, it says that Jesus was going to talk to Peter after breakfast. Now that breakfast was exposed to us and talked about to us early on in the, that text. You see, the men were out fishing all night, and Jesus said to them, this is what I want you to do. Have you caught anything? And they yelled back, nothing. Throw the net on the other side, and they caught more than they could. And Peter realized that it was Jesus, and he jumped into the water and swam there. And Jesus had grilled fish for them. Cooked on charcoal, the scripture says. And what we know about that breakfast is that it was a quiet one. Because the scripture says of those disciples, no one dared ask a question. No one there asked anything. It's as if there was tension there. Why? Because other than what Luke 24, 34 tells us that perhaps Jesus had had a conversation with Simon. This was the first time that Jesus and Simon had actually been together since the time of that denial. Oh yes, they had been in a group, but here they were face to face. And Jesus was going to publicly talk to Simon off to the side, and he was going to ask him some questions. It would be the same question three times. Remind you of anything? And Peter will answer it three times. And Jesus will give a command a little different each time. Now, Jesus asked this question. Do you love me more than these? And the first thing we have to do is understand, just like in English, the Greek from which our New Testament is translated here has different words for the word love. Now, I hope 
this is not a hard message for you because it's a hard one for me because most of you have preached it already. For we all know that the word that Jesus asked there of Peter is this, agape. And my understanding of that word is that it is love that is given even to one who will not return love. For instance, God so agape the world. And Paul would tell us it was while we were yet sinners. And we do would not want to love him. The object of his love did not want to return love. Now in premarital counseling, I go over to Ephesians, where Ephesians says, Husbands, you are to agape your wife. There might be occasions when she may not want to return love. And yet you are called, according to that text, to love. And Jesus said to Peter, Do you love me? And Peter answered back, but he answered back with a different word. He said this, Yes, I love you, but I love you like a brother. I love you even like a fictive kinship brother. I love you like a friend that is closer than a brother. And he said, that's how I love you. Now, I imagine the tension was breaking. But look what Jesus does. Jesus gives an imperative, a command. The command is a very simple one. Ten my lambs. Now, what do you know about lambs? They're cute and they're cuddly and you hold them. And Mary had one. Okay? That's what we know about lambs. They are the most defenseless. They are the ones who get hurt or lost, according to the parables. They are the ones who Peter was told, take care of the way a herdsman would take care of. But remember, do you love me more than these? Now, it is possible that he was saying to Peter, this is what I want to tell you. I want you to take, get away from your fishing occupation. Do you love me more than that? But I don't think so. In fact, I agree with A.T. Robertson, and I agree with Vincent, where both of them say, the people, what he was asking was, do you love me more than these other disciples of yours, of mine? Do you love me all more than your friends are? Because remember, Peter was the one that said, I'm going to whip out a sword and kill anybody that comes to get you, Jesus. And now he was put on hold, as it were. Do you love me more than these? And all Peter again could say, I love you like a brother. So look what Jesus does again. As Madge read, he said to him the second time, Do you love me? And again, there is that word agape. And then Peter answered the same way. I love you like a friend. I love you like a brother. And what occurred? Well, let me tell you what occurred. Jesus gave a command again. Only this command was, Shepherd my sheep. If you go to the book of 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, the second verse, you will discover that same kind of terminology there. Shepherd my flock. Shepherd my sheep. Sheep are older. Peter was supposed to take care of those sheep. Peter was to watch over them. Peter was to shepherd them. He's the guy that beat off the wolves, the bears, the lions, those that would come to destroy the sheep. He would be one who was called by Jesus to lay down his life for the sheep. But then there's a third time. And Jesus says, according to this, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Jesus doesn't use the word agape there. He now comes down to that friendship, brotherly kind of love. And he says to, he says to Peter, 
Here it is. You have said you love me this way. I'm asking you for real. Do you really love me this way? And it says Peter was grieved. Was he grieved because Jesus stopped using agape or was he grieved because all of a sudden Jesus put him on a spot? He was grieved. And his answer was, yes, that's the way I love you, Lord. And then Jesus says, take care of ten my young sheep. Watch over them. They're yours. The text says this. If this, then that. If this, then that. Peter, if you love me, then that you will do. Peter, if you love me, then that you will do. Peter, if you love me, then that you will do. You see, love is not supposed to be a feeling. Love is not supposed to be something that we say, oh well, I love everybody, and then sit where we are. If this, then that. You're believers. I want you to put yourself in the place of Peter right now. And Jesus is not asking if you love me even if the object of your love doesn't return it. He's asking a very simple question. Do you love me even as a friend? But if this, then that. Tend my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Watch over my young sheep. That's the call of believer through Peter. So right now, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I want everybody here to bow their heads and close their eyes. And I want to, first of all, to speak to believers. Now, how will I know you're a believer? Now, remember, I can't see well, and the lights don't help me. If you're here tonight, and you know for a surety that if Jesus would call you to heaven or you would pass away, that you would be with him. I want you to do something very simple. Raise your hand. Thank you. Now, if you raised your hand, you are now in the role of Peter. And if this, then that. If you raised your hand, you are called for the question Jesus asked, if you love me, to take care of, to tend the lambs who you know of, who are in your congregation at home, who are here at conference. They're the young ones that need to be held and discipled and counseled, and you need to do that. If this, then that. If this, then that. You are called to watch out for the sheep. Each of us must understand what doctrine is all about. Each of us must understand what Scripture is all about. And if you're a believer, your obligation is to protect others from the wolves that would enter the flock. And then thirdly, if this, then that, and you are here as a believer, you are called, you are called to take care of the young sheep. Those that haven't matured, those that drive you crazy in church, you are called, if this, then that. Now I want to speak for a moment to you if you didn't raise your hand. If you're here today and you are an unbeliever, we want you to come to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. You can do that simple. But the Bible says this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Two things, confess with your mouth, believe, and you can do that right here, right now, where you are. Now, believer, if you're here and you haven't been doing that, that part, here's a challenge for you. Tonight we're going to sing a hymn. It's called Just As I Am. And as we do, I want you to step out. I want you to come forward. And there's going to be at least four pastors here ready to meet you. 
and ready to pray with you so that when you begin from this point on, you will do the that part. Or if you're an unbeliever, we're going to invite you to step out and come and there'll be a person here who will show you, if you don't know already and you haven't done it yet, how you can have Jesus as your Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for this love that exists between Jesus and Peter. And I'm glad that Jesus was able to say, Peter, do you love me as a friend? My prayer tonight, Father, is that as believers, that we will accept the fact that we may only love him as a friend, but we're still called to do the that. And I pray if there's one here who does not know your son Jesus as Lord and Savior, that tonight might be the night of their decision. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, Just As I Am, and as we do, if you're here today and you need to make a decision for Christ, we invite you just to step out and to come.
If this, then that. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us from this moment into eternity. Go in grace.